Welcome to the industry.biz, industry news from industry people. So ironically, your previous show was called The Morning Hustle. I'm not mm -hmm. going to go too much detail about that just for political sake, because I kind of learned my lesson from doing my previous business that even though you're not at that corporation anymore, mm -hmm. uh, radio people don't generally like to talk for whatever, but I guess to keep their jobs. Right. So the situation might be a bit different because you're no longer there, but um, you really do hustle. I mean, you I do, do a whole lot of stuff. Did you come up with that name for the show? Absolutely not. Okay. All right. <laughs> well, but it's just the, con the concept, of course, because you're, you're a DJ, you're a rapper, you're a comedian. Um, you've done some, some TV stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, unfortunately in this 2024 space in which we operate in, mm -hmm. it's not like how it was in 1984 where like, yo, you're on the radio. That's all you got to do. Right. Like now you have to do a little bit of everything because, you know, so many aspects of this business is a business of diminishing returns. Yeah. So people are paying, getting paid way less to do the same jobs that people way back in the days would have done. And then you can walk into any business, whether it's entertainment or not, you have one person doing the jobs of like seven people for the right. paycheck of one. Right. And so, especially in the entertainment space, you can't just rely on one particular thing because it's ever evolving. Right. It's never the same as it was a month ago, a week ago, a year ago. So you have to keep so many irons in the fire just in case somebody steal one of the irons. Right. And you still got a few more to go, you know? Exactly. I like to look at it like a legs under the table. You got to make yeah. sure that all four legs are there. Um, I wanted to, uh, one thing I always wanted to ask you was about Dish Nation. Yeah. Um, first of all, how did that come about? How did you get on there? Yo, so major shout out to Rock T, who's a part of the Ricky Smiley Morning Show. He was the person who was contacted first by the producers of that show about finding different radio shows that would be a good fit for an entertainment news show that was shot daily. Mm -hmm. uh, and he brought that to the team and everybody thought it was going to be a fantastic idea, which it was. And we shot the pilot. The pilot tested well. We went to a six week test run. The test run tested phenomenally. And here we are on season 12. Wow. And that's is it's hard to be on TV for a long time. I mean, we talking Keenan Thompson numbers right now. You know what I mean? Hey, you've been on there that long? Yo, I am like the R2-D2 or C-3PO of the situation. I've been there since episode one. You know what Got I mean? It. Got it. So it, it's a blessing. And uh, and it's also probably been like one of the biggest alley-oops that radio has given me. Because, you know, I'm not so naive in the fact that, no, like, hey, one thing set up the other thing. But it was a like climbing a ladder. So now, whereas radio is very two-dimensional, you, you know, you hear a voice. Maybe you meet these people at a meet and greet. TV puts you on for the rest of the country for all those cities that you maybe are not on the radio in or for all those people who maybe don't listen to the radio or don't listen to the type of music that you would play on the radio. They know you from this thing now. So it it's provided, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, yeah. So it's definitely opened up a lot of opportunities and put my name and face in front of a lot more people. I was going to ask you, has it provided opportunities whereas you, you do other things in other cities? Absolutely. Like, you know, like the cool thing, similar to radio where like, you know, Hey, they want you to come down to this car dealership on the flip side, Dish Nation to be like, Hey, we need you to go to this uh, big festival in LA. Like, you know, like taste of soul mm -hmm. was the first time I actually got to go to LA and see like other black people. Okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause like when they would send me down for um American idol and this is on the radio side of things, like I'm over there by the Nokia center and I'm like, where are we at? Yeah. This isn't what I saw in movies. Where we mm. at? And it wasn't to the taste of soul. I was like, oh, this is where we at. Well, and I've been here, I've been here for 30 years. I'm still looking for black people. And yeah, you <laughs> were there and <laughs> you were there in the area where there are a majority. There, there's an influx in that area. But you're you're absolutely right. LA is extremely spread out. And mm. it is really hard to tie into culture here. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably get some flack for that, but it's true. Um so it provides uh, other opportunities for you. Of course, opportunities that pay you more right, and, and more lucrative than radio would have. Um, what was it like when Kid Craddock died? It was very eerie and ironic at the same time because a couple days prior, we did an episode 
about what would the last things that you would want to say to people oh, no. before you die. Oh, wow. And it wasn't a week, maybe at max a week and a half mm -hmm. that he passed away suddenly. Wow. So it was definitely very jarring because, you know, I'm one of those people that when I'm a part of something with you, we're family, we're a team. Mm -hmm. And I've only had an opportunity to meet Kid Craddock. Well, I'm not going to say only because I met him a lot. Because, you know, living in Dallas, you know, you cross paths with these radio people, whether it's at a convention or whatever, or just out about in the streets because Dallas is really small. I would run into Kid Craddock, Kelly Raspberry, Big Al. Uh, I didn't start meeting JC and uh, Jenna until we started doing Dish. But, you know, these are people I knew. These are people I knew from the business. These are people I listened to. So it was like losing a relative, mm -hmm. you know, when he passed away. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and a major shout out to his team because they was able to soldier on and if not be even stronger mm -hmm. with this passing, which was shocking because, you know, a lot of people, you know, a lot of times when, when the, the head of the table passes away, the show is over, pack it up, everybody, right. let's go home. Mm -hmm. But they really showed how talented that whole squad was. And it also points, you know, paints the picture like, hey, listen, one person's name may be on a show, but it's all the characters that make the show the show. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? Like Martin is great, but Martin could not have been the Martin show we know without mm -hmm. Pam, Gina, Cole, Tommy, Shanene, you know, and all the other things that went on with that. So it's a great ensemble cast and uh, they definitely uh, proved how strong they were without Kid around. I was going to ask you, what was it like that, that like the first few days when you came back? I mean, how did everybody, uh, how, how did you do it? Well, uh, be, because how we would tape the show, right? Mm -hmm. Because we were on East Coast time. So we would start filming a little bit earlier, right? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so we would do our part. And then around maybe 30, 45 minutes in, we would pipe into Dallas, you know, going down the board and mm -hmm. they would tap in. So it was together and separate at the same time. Got it. Got it. You know what I mean? So it's not like being in the room and not seeing that person in the room no more. It's just like, hey, there was one less voice on the phone, mm -hmm. you know, from that point on. And, uh, you know, it, it's just crazy, man, like how like life is like a jack in the box. You never know how many times you could crank that gear before death pop up on you and, and, right. and you're no longer here, man. So, you know, you just got to cherish every moment for what it is and, and and stretch and stretch it out and leave as many impactful moments as you can. Just okay. so like people be fighting to talk at your funeral. Right. Yeah. So when you did, uh, you went from Dallas to doing the Ricky Smiley show, how did that come about? So I had a nice show with mm -hmm. me, Super K and my homie Kino from the Bodega Brothers, the group I do on the side. Right. And we were doing tremendously well at night. And it was definitely getting to a point where I was starting to get bored because in radio, you will start with one program director and then you will have a bunch of other program directors that come and go. And mm -hmm. I know everybody's radio story is different because I know some people who have been bounced around from city to city, right? Mm -hmm. um, I am like a car who's only had like really like one owner. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Two at max. So uh, I, I was with the same station and company for the, pretty much the, the whole entirety of my radio career, right? So mm -hmm. as we was getting into like year four of the night show, we were like on our fifth PD and the show felt to me way different than it did when we started because we just had all of this unlimited freedom. Right. And some of those freedoms started getting taken away because of how corporate radio started to get. And because my background prior to radio, I was in the marketing side of records. Like mm -hmm. I came from um, right before I, I started doing radio, I used to work for EMI, mm -hmm. which was like, you know, the distribution house, for like Virgin Records, Rap-A-Lot. Um, damn, who else we had under there? I think we had Blue Note, Capital, and a whole bunch of other ones. So I am friends with a lot of these record label people. So I mm -hmm. had great relationships with mm -hmm. people and it gave me a lot of power and right. not the type of power that I would abuse because some people are were definitely on the take. Like, okay. hey, man, if you do this for me, I'm going to make sure this record get a certain amount of space. No, we were so fair and honest in how we operated because we heard the horror stories about how many people were getting broke off to do things, and it compromises the product. And that's one thing that's always been consistent about me. You cannot buy my opinion. Right. It's not for sale. 
If right. I don't like it, I don't like it. If it's whack, it's whack. Mm -hmm. So they liked us for that. You know okay. what I mean? So we would get records before the PD would get them. And our original PD was like, hey, if you hear something you like, you play it. Make sure it's clean. And it became from, a like, threat. Became a threat. Mm -hmm. Like, yo, why are people talking to y'all first before they talk right. to us? And and mm -hmm. I can understand that there's a peck in order because like sometimes program directors might have a play that they're trying to make. Like, yo, we're gonna we're gonna act like we're not gonna play this just so we can get them to like budge on this thing. So right. I understand that, right? So it was what it was, but you know, one thing at a time, they just kept taking things away from us, and I'm like, this isn't fun to me anymore. And we right, were right. winning doing what we were doing, mm -hmm. so. Why why are you coming in here and messing? Like it's like when they mess with the formula for Coca-Cola. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, yo, we're gonna make it Coca-Cola classic. Like, no, we don't want classic. We want the Coke we have now and we're gonna push it to the future. But so anyway, I was getting bored and I was trying to figure out what I was about to do next. And then the opportunity to do mornings came. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't until then that I realized how much of a 12 years of slave situation I was in at that moment because. When you first get into radio, especially during that time, mm -hmm. you were working six days a week. Right. Like, we worked Monday through Saturday. Yeah. So I literally had one day off. Mm -hmm. And what you're telling me is I only have to now work Monday through Friday. Mm -hmm. And then Friday, when I get off at like 10 o'clock in the morning, I'm kind of free to roam about the country. Mm -hmm. It was an attractive situation. So it took very little convincing for me to be like, hell yeah, I'll do it. Okay. Okay. And then going from having complete control of your own show mm -hmm. to now being, um, I don't want to say a sidekick, but not, not being in a dominant position anymore. Was that hard to adjust to? It was tough because that wasn't what I was sold on in the beginning. Oh, okay. you know what I mean? And this was a theme that would continuously Haunt you. appear throughout <laughs> my tenure for the rest of the time there. Like, they'll tell you one thing, and then uh, when you get you there, you'd be like, oh, whoa, this is not what I thought it was, you know? Yep. And it was one of those situations where I will shut the F up and be quiet just so I can figure out how to win in the situation, right? Because, mm -hmm. like, you could come in and you could flip tables over and everybody's like, ah, oh, that guy is a jerk and he means it, whoop de woo or you could shut up and just like, all right, how can we make this work? And how, how can I f like fit? Because, you know, also when you go from doing nights, something that you're sure of to doing mornings, which to me felt like a completely different job and monster, which right. it was. Mm -hmm. Because like at night you could talk, but in the morning you get to talk a little bit long. Right. And you got to cover a little bit more things in the morning. You know what I mean? Right. So. I was like, all right, cool. They, they definitely don't want to make waves right now. Like, just figure this job out, ride the wave, and figure out how you could be the best team player you can to make the show win. Mm -hmm. And that was my job one. You know what I mean? Like, no matter how many people came in and out of that door, different co-hosts or whatnot, how can I be the conduit that makes the car run no matter how many parts we change out whether we go from uh, automatic brakes to the anti-lock joints to you know whether we go with the uh, cruise control to the self-driving, how can I continue to make sure the it car runs? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know the Desmond Tutu of radio is what I dubbed myself. Uh, right. Okay. <laughs> creating peace um, <laughs> where everything isn't always harmonious. Right. Um, okay, so you're in a situation where you see a lot of changes, mm -hmm. uh, people coming and going especially women. Yeah. Um, what is it like to be in a situation where you're on a morning show and you haven't quite had an opportunity to gel with the new people and you're kind of doing that in real time while still trying to have a great show? I, mean, I guess what I'm asking is, has there ever been a situation where it was rocky, but you made it work? My entire radio career? With the okay. exception of doing nights? Well, I mean, I, I realize that's an anomaly and that's kind of like a, a rhetorical question because you, mm -hmm. you realize I was in radio before you. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I definitely know a little bit of the history. Yes. But but I'm asking for the audience. <laughs> I'm trying to entertain the audience. So. Understood, understood. <laughs> um, it, it It's difficult, right? But it depends on your personality and temperament. 
Right. I am a person who thrives on different things. Like mm -hmm. in my work environment, I want peace, ebb, and flow. Because when you work in a tense environment, I don't think you really are truly going to get the best out of anybody unless you're playing like professional sports. Sports. Professional right, right. sports will be tense and everybody's going to be on edge and be, you know, but radio, you know, people got to feel like you low key smiling on the other side of the radio. Or if you're mm -hmm. sad, they want to feel your sadness, too. So I definitely always wanted to try to create harmony or just do my part to make everything flow the way it needed to, no matter who was in the room mm -hmm. at that time. You know what I'm saying? Whether everybody was rocking with everybody or not. That was just my thing. I, you know, I, I've always kind of been a peacemaker. Like they, even in high school, like I would hang with gangbangers, mm -hmm. nerds, mm -hmm. and 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 everything in between, mm -hmm. just because I was always just that gel and that glue and that same energy, like really transferred over to radio. So mm -hmm. if you have the personality or the temperament for that type of role, it's a great space. But mm -hmm. if you're one of those like only child mentality people and think it's all about me, 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 you may either have a harder time or a or even maybe even a, a fast track at it. There is really no recipe or rule to who wins and who loses in this game. Like, you know, because by the numbers, there was no way in hell I'm supposed to be on the radio by mm -hmm. the numbers. Like mm -hmm. there's no way. like I literally made a tape with my friends while we were at a, like the day after being at a party because we wanted to make a tape so we could try to get on the show. And we thought we was going to do overnights and we ended up doing the night show. Mm -hmm. Like, and we had no prior radio experience, like mm -hmm. none whatsoever, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. it, it worked out, mm -hmm. you know? That's generally how it is. It's like, you never know anything till you ask. That's one of my favorite, you know, statements. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you have to ask twice, but Facts. whatever you want, ask and mm -hmm. it's yours. Um, Another question I have. So you go from being on the Ricky Smiley show to getting your own show. Mm -hmm. uh, how how did that? Well, I know how it came about because Tom Joyner left and then it was said that Ricky was going to replace Tom Joyner and then you were supposed to replace Ricky. Mm -hmm. Was that the way it worked? Well, yeah. I mean, I, replace is an interesting word, but, you know, there was a vacancy left by Tom Joyner's departure and somebody had to occupy that corporate slot, you know, for the syndicated you know, adult contemporary space. Mm -hmm. I think he was the perfect fit for that. You know, he has a little bit of an older target demo. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, it, it, it was a no brainer. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to cross over into that space. And actually more so than anything, I was actually ready to quit at that point. I was not going to renew my contract mm -hmm. because I just felt like I hit a ceiling. Like, yo, I'm on a number one morning show where syndicated, what else is there? Let me go focus on my mood, my music and stuff because 2020 is about to be the best year ever for everybody. That's mm -hmm. like what I'm thinking, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, man plans, God laughs, right? Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, the little voices in my head was like, hey, hear these people out. They're trying to like, you know, create a new opportunity. And what was happening was the company was going to create two shows at the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, they was going to create my show. And then it was this other show called The Morning Hustle, which started in D.C. early. Mm -hmm. And the person who was overseeing my show between point A and point B was no longer with the company. And then I became somebody else's problem. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they're like, oh, just merging with, with this other show. And mm -hmm. then that's kind of how it happened. And there was a lot of great trajectory when I joined that situation in the beginning. But a lot of times in, in corporate situations, I think when you have so many different talents and talented people, mm -hmm. uh, they all get promised and told different things. Mm -hmm. And it creates a, a weird psychology mm -hmm. amongst the room. And right. then also, too, you don't never know what people have been through in the business prior to you getting there. Right. And I know my journey and I'm like, hey. Whatever goes on, I want to make sure the room that I operate in every day doesn't feel like any other room I had to operate in every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So it was an adjustment period. And then, you know, we're a few months into the new show and boom, COVID-19 happens, becomes this thing. And while we're in the midst of trying to really get our chemistry going, we're all sent to our separate corners in different parts of the country and are recording a show every day from home. Mm -hmm. So it was a show that was forged together in some of the wildest times mm -hmm. and not necessarily under the best circumstances. 
And then once again, you're you're put together with people you don't really know. I mean, I, you may have known a couple of the people because I know at, at the beginning there was quite a few people on that show. It was like Wu Tang, well, half Wu Tang. It was like five of us, right? Okay. Uh, and then, um, yeah, but they were all picked. It, like the fight was fixed. Like, you know, right. cause, like I because I knew who I personally wanted mm -hmm. to put on the show, and like strategically, none of it happened. And that's always a warning. Oh, that was red flag number one. So yes. from point from that point on, right, my antenna is up, and I know yeah. I'm I'm like playing a card game where you know cats got other cards under the table. Somebody might do something under the sleeve. So right. I'm you know I'm constantly on my swivel and protecting my energy the whole time because I know the BS is at play. However. Yeah. This isn't my first rodeo in an uncomfortable environment. Yeah. So I'm going to show up every day. I'm going to fight the good fight. And my only goal mm -hmm. is to win. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, and we had a lot of like bright spots, you know, and there was, uh, you know, in some markets where I wish we could afford a little harder in, but, you know, I cannot do everybody's job. Right. Right. Did you, um, while you were doing the show and when it, when it came to an end, was that your decision or the company's decision? It was like a like I, I've been quoted before by saying it was a Mexican standoff, and it truly was. Mm -hmm. It was one of those things where I was really left with no choice mm -hmm. but to take the route that I took mm -hmm. because there's a lot of things that maybe I'll speak about in the future that I knew were going on mm -hmm. that didn't sit right with me. Okay. And that I knew of, and I'm like, this is, yeah. Like it's a continuation of everything that was foul in the beginning, but you know, for a longer play. And it was one of those situations where how can you be in a casino playing a game and you know, the house is here to cheat. Mm. You know what I mean? Like you got too many, you got too many, hands working against you and it's like hey listen my mental health is the most important thing to me and i am truly unhappy in this situation and i'm i'm not going to be throwing punches in every direction trying to keep something afloat when the you know when the people that i'm fighting for and with don't necessarily have the same loyalty to me bro it's not just your mental health it's your peace of mind first there, there's that too. You know what I mean? <laughs> your, like, your, yeah, your mental health is important, but it's like if you don't have peace, you're not going to have good mental health. No, so, this is true. This yeah. Is true. So you and gotta as have, the mm -hmm. older you get, brother, like the 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 weaker that muscle called the brain gets. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, far as like your ability to endure the things that you could have done with no problem prior. Right. Right. Like you either can turn into the same monster that everybody else is, mm -hmm. or you can be yourself still mm -hmm. and just know when to be like, you know what? I don't I don't like the food here. I'm leaving this restaurant. Right. You know I mean? And then your bandwidth changes. I mean, you can actually still I think ultimately one thing I, uh, that I would say has been the greatest lesson for me, per se, is and I see you've learned this too, strategy. Mm hmm. You know, like the old commercial, you say, never let them see you sweat. It's like if you play strategy and you do it well, you'll win. Because the minute you get pissed off or you get upset, that means that you're the bad guy. You're mm -hmm. the one that's not going to get invited to the party. You're the one who looks like, you know, you got a problem, even if somebody's done you dead wrong. So strategy oh, yeah. I have learned in the hardest way is key. Uh, another question. So you leave the show. And I'm sure that you you had some trepidation about that because it, I'm sure it paid very well. Mm -hmm. um, if I was to come to you and say, hey, I got another syndicated show for you. Mm -hmm. Would you take it? Yeah, I'm not. I am not in a space where I'm like, I hate radio and I would never do it again. Mm -hmm. um, it just has to be under the right circumstances. You what, know what are I the mean? right circumstances? Uh, right circumstances is uh, understanding that I am a creative mm -hmm. and my ideas may sound out the box to you. Mm -hmm. However, my ideas work. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of things that I brought to the Ricky Smiley Morning Show that worked mm -hmm. and still work to this day. Right. 
there's things that I that I wanted to take with me to my new show mm -hmm. that for whatever reason people wouldn't let me take them with me even though other people weren't doing those things mm -hmm. anymore. So, you know, my ideas have to be respected. Mm -hmm. Um and I I need a company and a team alongside me that wants to win by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. We are fighting so many different platforms absolutely for, for attention mm -hmm. and there was there was conversations i would have about like you know what i saw the future of the business being mm. that and they they the go-to for a lot of people was like hey your opinion doesn't count because you're young and you listen to underground hip-hop oh wow <laughs> you know and it's like yo man i'm outside Mm -hmm. I'm around real people doing real things. I'm around young people studying what they're rocking with. And we need to have our content here. Okay. We need to be doing this. We need to be doing more of that. And I was constantly hit with no, 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 that's a terrible idea. We're not, we're not doing that. And we're winning doing what we're doing. But yeah, you could be winning the war right now, but the perceptual war that mm -hmm. we're losing eventually will cause you to lose the real war. Wow. And they didn't understand it. And now I'm seeing a lot of people winning with things that I wanted to do. <laughs> and we, we were slow. On. What do you think the disconnection is? Why do you think um, that there is that disconnection between the older generation and the younger generation? I think, you know, the short version is everybody has somebody to answer to and they're scared of the person that they got to answer to. Okay. It's a trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. Like somebody who is right over your shoulder going hard on you has somebody over their shoulder going hard on them. Okay. Who has a bunch of probably investors looking mm -hmm. at them crazy when things don't work out. So people try to go the safe route with things out of fear. Right. Whereas radio arts, especially black art, Mm -hmm. It's always supposed to be rebellious and it's always mm. supposed to be adventurous. It's always supposed to be cutting edge right. and not following the pack, but leading mm. the pack. Yeah. And radio has become a, a follower, uh, you know. Instead of an architect. Yeah, you know. And mm -hmm. also, too, you have a lot of people making decisions for the culture who are Why not, not part of the culture. Of the culture at right, all, right, right. Mm -hmm. not even remotely culture adjacent. Right. And these are some of the issues that has radio in a space and place where they are right now. That's I across go... the board throughout the industry. And that's why you're here. And me, mm -hmm. we're supposed to fulfill that that narrative. <laughs> right. you know, under Underneath, under, under the guide of those people. A um, mm -hmm. couple of more questions real quick. I know you have to go soon. Um, you're a fan of Raising Canaan and so am I. Oh, yeah, yeah. Why, you know, I was kind of debating, I, I love 50 Cent shows, but I was kind of debating if I liked Raising Canaan or what's the one with Mary J. Blige? I forgot the name. That, that's really uh, That sad. is uh, Power Book 2, Ghost. Power Book 2. I actually liked that one more at first. And I thought they were very similar in the beginning. Mm -hmm. You know, the powerful woman in charge, you know, running the, the whatever the organization. But Raising Canaan, I don't know what the hell is going on with that show. It is really good. And Rock is amazing. I mean, I've seen yes. her, her other stuff, and she's amazing. And so is the girl that plays the lesbian. Uh, yeah, you're talking about, you know, as soon as you start talking, I knew her name, and it escaped me. I, I, I did, too. Who the, plays uh, Jukebox. Um, Jukebox. Right. Haley Kilgore is her name. Right. Ha Haley Kilgore not only is a phenomenal actress, but she's right. an amazing singer, too. Like she yeah. actually makes music outside of power and she's dope. I got a chance to meet her on a red carpet. Uh, I was doing interviews for Dish uh, for the the Black Music Honors Awards and just a glowing ball of awesomeness when she hit the red carpet. So what would you like your legacy to be? My legacy, I would love to be that uh, Head Crack opened doors, raised the consciousness of the people and gave a lot of people opportunities and most importantly, hope. Okay. Because if I could do it, you can do it. You just got to have your head on straight and, and be fair and just in your dealings and be truthful in your intent. Mm -hmm. Who are some of the people that you admire most in the industry? Uh, the people I admire the most in the industry. 
Wendy Williams, um, Star and Buck Wild, mm -hmm. Sway, mm -hmm. um, Russ Parr. Mm -hmm. um, Me. The um, Breakfast, so the I Breakfast have Club. <laughs> well, I, well, I'm talking specifically on the air, like currently. Like I didn't get a chance to check you out when you was on the air as a personality. But right. as far as people who I grew up looking, is like, yo, this is the template and the arc, the archetype. And even now that I'm like, you know, biz radio adjacent and not all the way in, you right. know, I've had more time to listen to certain shows, and I'm like, hey, you know, I mean, Sway has always been great to me, but like because Breakfast Club came on at the same time that Ricky Smiley Morning Show and. The Morning Hustle did, never had an opportunity to really listen because I okay. wasn't one of those people who would get off work and listen to other shows. Because right. no, I'm going to go live a real life and experience things. I have something to talk about the next morning. So right. now that I get to listen to the show, I'm like, oh, wow, that show is great. And they're doing things that I said we should do. Jess is amazing. I mean, she brings something to the show that I don't think the show was ready for. I mean, it's, it's just a whole new energy. I, I really yeah. like listening to the show now. Then I also have to give credit to Troy. What's his name? Is it Troy Terrain? The, the oh, one Star. That... Yeah, Troy Terrain. Star. Okay, like, Troy man. Terrain. Because he went to Atlanta and basically, I need to reach out to him, put together a show from scratch. You know, and I see his stuff on YouTube. I'm like, he is really killing it. You know, I mean, he, he made a decision to move. He, he's got a great format. Show's very entertaining. Uh, and some of the other people you mentioned, Wendy, I think, is... Did you watch the movie? I did. What'd you think? It what it, it explained a lot of things mm -hmm. because um I don't know if you got a chance to like like the last year she was on, she would shout me out like semi regularly mm -hmm. towards the end, right? And and I eventually ended up doing an episode of her show, and like one day I called her, and the conversation was so bizarre. Yeah. I couldn't understand, I like you ever just like you get done with the phone conversation, and you just look at the phone because you just don't understand what just happened. Right. Like that was what that conversation was like. And when you get the curtains pulled back and you get the reveal that, oh, okay. Yeah. This makes sense now. Right. Because, you know, like I started, you know, over the last five years, I've started to encounter more and more people who have dementia. Or mm -hmm. know people who have dementia, right? And the the personality swings are crazy. Yeah. And to yeah. see that in the documentary, it it just made everything make a lot more sense. Yeah, I had a friend who died of that exact same dementia. It was it was quite tragic to see because yeah. that with that one, everything goes your body goes first, and then your mind is the last thing to go, which is in opposition to the other forms of dementia. So, is and then once your mind goes, you're you're out of here. Yeah. Uh, but hers, I never knew there was alcohol-induced dementia. I never knew that. Neither so, did I. And yeah, literally, if she stops drinking, you know, she can reduce a lot of that. But I don't know if that's going to happen. So we got less than a minute. It is always great to talk to you. I wish Likewise. we had more time to talk. And I will definitely, uh, you know, stay in touch and wish you continued success. Yo, appreciate your support for all these years. And I know we just getting started. We ain't stopping, baby. Absolutely, bro. All Later, right. Kev. All right. Peace. Take care.